Well, good morning, everybody. It's uh, June 3rd, 2020, and we're here at the Fort Worth Aviation Museum, home to the most touchable warbirds in Texas. Uh, I'm here by myself today. Gary couldn't make it, and we don't have anybody else who wanted to do this one, because we're going to be talking about the Rodney Dangerfield of our, uh, uh, of our airplanes here at the uh, museum. Today we're going to be talking about the T-37, the Cessna T-37 trainer. Uh, this airplane, uh, as, as one of our uh, one of our Air Force people said, uh, after he quit he quit flying it uh, in the training command, he uh, he immediately uh, dumped every all the information uh, from his mind. If you were uh, uh, hi Mike, uh, hi Britt, if you were in the Air Force any time uh, between about 1967 and 2009, you flew this airplane. Uh, this was the basic trainer for all of the Air Force pilots in all of the uh, all of the regimes that they flew in. So it was designed by Cessna. Uh, it was uh, designed, it started the design in 1964, which I think is interesting because you think about the T-33 that we talked about uh, last week, that started the de design in 48, and then the T-28 was also in 48 and 49. So we went from those airplanes to six years later, we were designing a jet trainer for the in fact the first jet trainer that the Air Force had uh, specifically uh, still on my bucket list to fly okay Bill uh, so uh, it was the first jet trainer that the Air Force uh, that the Air Force ever had designed now it went through a number of different iterations and we'll talk about those a little bit uh, but this one is a uh, is a Air Force T-37B and we'll let you get up here and see the serial number so if there's any of you who want to want to check this out I've got the information and I'll share that with you as to where this airplane uh, actually served but it served a number of different places it was at Dobbins Air Force Base it was out at, uh, at uh, Williams at uh, Willie out in Arizona it was in uh, Columbus Ohio uh, it served in a lot of different locations now uh, we say this one doesn't get enough respect uh, this is maybe the ugly duckling of our collection. Uh, as you can see, the uh, the windscreen is in bad shape, and we have been looking for years to find a. Uh, uh, hi, Roy. Uh, we've been looking for years to find a new windscreen for this. So, if any of you happen to have a windscreen laying around for a T37, we would be glad to take it off of your hands. Uh, the cockpit is empty on this airplane, uh, which we have a plan to maybe fix that and change that. Uh, because this would be a really good airplane uh, for people to be able to do cockpit tours. You can see no ladder required, and if it is at all, it's just a step stool to be able to get into the cockpit. Side-by-side uh, -side seating, which was ideal for, uh, for training venue, but there's a lot of similarities between this airplane and the T-37, or the T-33, rather. You know, we're going to look at it. It's got a straight wing. It has essentially the same aileron and uh, flap system. As the uh, as the T33 does, it's not a high performance wing by any stretch. Uh, the area here where the uh, where the uh, red is, it's part of an exhaust area for the airplane. Uh, I'm going to show you a couple of things on here. Uh, this airplane was also designed to be easy to be serviced, so you can see we've got a a low pressure oxygen filler valve right here on the other side. We've got hydraulics. Now this is something that we haven't seen on. On many of the other airplanes they all have it but it's not always in a place where you can easily get at it um, it's a grounding point so when the airplanes are being refueled you're going to go ahead and you're going to stick a wire in there and then it's going to go ahead and be grounded to someplace on the ground especially during refueling to avoid any kind of static charge and once again here's our here's our ever-present static static port uh, let's see let's see if we can if i can read the screen any better today uh, somebody said I called it the scrubbing bubbles, okay. Uh, this airplane's been called a lot of things. Uh, one of them is the uh, pregnant dog whistle. Uh, the initial uh, engine that was used in this airplane was a J69, and uh, it was very loud. And because of the airplane and the size and everything, it was, it was called a lot of different things. But uh, in the Marine Corps and in the Navy, we used to refer to it as the uh, pregnant dog whistle. You can see you don't have a flying tail, but you do have you do have an elevator with a trim tab. So you can see that there's some of the carryover from the uh, uh, from the earlier jets, like the T-33, but there are some advancements. 
So here's our trim tab on the t on the rudder. And we have to apologize for the condition of the wings. This airplane sat under trees for a number of years out here and sap, and it's just really, really difficult to get off. If we had enough support for this airplane, we would probably repaint it, but we don't have, uh, we don't have a lot of direct support for this airplane. Um, so you've got uh, some of the similar things on this side. You've got another static port on this side of the airplane. You've got another grounding port. And this, is, of course, is the exhaust from the engine. And then right here we have a hydraulic reservoir uh, refill port. Very easy for people to, uh, to service on the ground. They didn't need a lot of ladders or a lot of extensions and a lot of things like that to be able to, uh, uh, to, be able to service the airplane. So as I mentioned, there were a number of variations on this airplane. And uh, one of the first variations on the airplane was what is referred to as the A-37, the attack version. Remember, we've talked about that. Uh, T is for trainer, uh, O is for observation, A is for attack. And we're going to talk about all of those here in a minute. Uh, right off the nose, although we don't have one, is the pitot-static tube that gets that ram air pressure so that you can tell how fast you're going. The little fin here on the nose is an antenna. Most of the time when you see a little fin like that, that's exactly what it is, it's a radio antenna of some sort. And the fins along the nose are to give the airplane some stability in the landing pattern so that you can maintain some airflow along the bottom of the fuselage. Very easy airplane to fly. That was the whole idea in building it as a trainer, was that it was going to be very easy to fly. I'm going to walk around to the other side here because I want you to be able to see it next to the O2, the, the O2 Skymaster. Remember, they're both Cessna airplanes, both built in, uh, in Wichita, Kansas. But the, uh, the A-37 in the middle 60s, after uh, we were involved in Vietnam, uh, you know, the OV-10 was, uh, was being designed to replace the O-1, and the O-2 was put into service by the Air Force as a stopgap airplane until they could have something uh, something better to replace the O-1. Well, they kept flying it and then decided that uh, the T-37 was going to be a good candidate for uh, an airplane to be used as, a, uh, uh, as an observation airplane or as an attack airplane. So the Air Force started a program in, I believe it was about 1967, that was called Combat Dragon. Now, if that name uh, sounds familiar, that's because Combat Dragon 2 is what the military referred to the program uh, that uh, brought the OV-10 G pluses uh, into existence that uh, went into uh, went into Iraq uh, just a few years ago. But this was the original Combat Dragon program, and one of the things they did is they changed the engines from the underpowered J-69s to a much more efficient and better engine, which is the J-85, which is used in lots and lots of airplanes, used in the T-38. Uh, it's even used as APUs for, uh, for some of the bigger transport airplanes. Uh, so in addition, when they made it an attack airplane, they put, uh, they put hard points on the wings so that they could sh uh, shoot missiles, rockets, drop bombs, and, and also guns. Uh, very stable platform. Uh, talking to one of our folks here earlier who did not want to be interviewed about the T-37, <laughs> said that when he was a forward air controller in, uh, in Vietnam and was... Uh, uh, flying, uh, flying OV-10s and controlling airplanes later, uh, later in the war, that uh, he always liked the A-4s and A-37s. He said they were stable and they could put bombs on targets every time, uh, much better than, uh, than most of the rest of the aircraft. Uh, now, of course, this would have better performance than the O-2 side-by-side -side seating, so it gives you that, uh, that capability, pretty good visibility. So that was for the OA-37, which was a derivative of the A-37. Remember, O being observation and A being attack. Let's see if I can read any questions here. And I'm still having trouble. It's so bright out here, it's hard to read anything that's on the screen. Uh, so the, uh, the A-37s were put into, uh, uh, were put into play in uh, Vietnam. The uh, Vietnamese Air Force flew them. Uh, the U.S. Air Force flew them. Uh, they call them dragonflies, too. I mean, we call it tweets or tweety birds because that's what most people refer to it as out of training. Uh, but the, uh, the attack version was referred to as a dragonfly and, uh, or a super tweet uh, because of the, uh, the engine 
So this is a B model. We went from the A to the B. Uh, and then, uh, so you can see, uh, see together the two airplanes here, the, the uh, T-37 and the O-2. So you can get a real good side-by-side -side comparison of the two airplanes as they back up here and try not to fall. So there you can see that part of it. So let's see. Ah, good afternoon, James. Glad to see you. Glad to see all of you folks that have been coming out here and, uh, and watching these videos with us. Uh, we're kind of running out of airplanes, so what we're going to be looking at doing is trying to do some of these videos uh, either on request, if you got a special request, special airplane, special aspect of an airplane that you'd, uh, you'd like to talk about, we'd be glad to do that for you. Uh, the other thing is that we're going to... Uh, we're going to attempt to do some interviews with people who either flew or worked on these airplanes uh, out in front of the airplane itself. Now, a couple of a uh, couple of announcements while I'm thinking about it. Uh, the uh, the museum is going to be open Saturdays only for a while, and uh, from from nine until two. That'll start this weekend, and uh, we are making plans to be able to open up the inside of the museum for uh, limited quantities of visitors. Let's see. I'm trying to read what's on the screen here. Please do the Huey. I wish we had a Huey to do. Um, about the only Huey that we've got is the attack version of the Huey, which is sometimes referred to as the AH-1 Cobra. But we do not have a Huey. That's an airplane that uh, we've wanted to have here for quite a long time. And uh, we've never been able to acquire a, a Huey in, in a good enough condition that it would be worthwhile to have. Let's see. Yeah, I'm not catching much of anything else. So we'll walk around the airplane a little bit closer again for anybody who might be a modeler. But you can see it's real low to the ground, so it's very easy to climb in and out of the airplane. Uh, but that's also that also made it a problem because you can see where the intakes on the jets are. Low intake to the ground, which means that they were susceptible to uh, to FOD. Uh, the other thing that we found with this airplane is they were very susceptible. Uh, they were very susceptible to uh, to icing, icing conditions. Uh, when I was flying uh, A4s out of Kingsville, and we would go through Williams Air Force Base a lot going to uh, the West Coast, uh, we'd stop into Williams and we always met, uh, met Air Force crews. And if it had been a day where there was some ice or some bad weather, uh, the T-38 people and the A-37 people would always be there to ask you whether you were picking up any ice because they couldn't fly. You can see this is a relatively fat wing, especially compared to the, uh, the, the T-38 or the F-5. Uh, the airplane was designed as a trainer for, uh, for not only basic training, but it was also used uh, for navigation and formation flying. Uh, and uh, all, all indications are that it did a pretty good job of all of that, but it was underpowered. That J-69 just, uh, just didn't do much for it. But it became uh, a whole lot different when, uh, when they turned it into the A-37 and put the, uh, put the J-85 engines on it. That should be a pretty good look at the, uh, A30, the T-37 compared to the O2 back there. So again, this, uh, this airplane doesn't get as much love as it should because there's an awful lot of people who've flown this airplane. Again, it was not only used as a trainer, it was used as a station aircraft for a while after, uh, after training, um, uh, completion of it being used as a trainer. So lots and lots of people have flown this. Again, between 1967 or so and 2009, if you went through the Air Force flight program, you flew this airplane. So uh, always looking for an opportunity to improve some of our aircraft, uh, but we, uh, we do have what we refer to here as affinity groups, and that's how we, uh, we fund the restoration on airplanes. People who have a particular affinity for, uh, for a particular airplane uh, will, uh, will help us with, uh, with either work or with, uh, uh, with funds to be able to restore these. This one's not going to take a lot of work. Uh, the paint and, uh, and some of the tar from the, uh, or sap from the, from the trees are going to have to come off. But uh, as far as uh, metal work, this one will require very little. So uh, what it really needs is a new windshield that would make it look great. And then a new paint job would, uh, would spiff it up quite a bit too. Uh, 
mention, we have a uh, we have a T37 simulator that nobody's been able to make work, and uh, so we've thought about uh, numerous times of maybe just taking that simulator and installing the seats and the and the uh, and the instrument panel and everything inside of this airplane. <clears throat> excuse me, so that we would have a, a full cockpit and people would be able to uh, do an open cockpit day with this airplane. Little tiny tires. Very noisy on the outside. <laughs> Not sure what it was like on the inside. But we've had some good weather. Uh, we opened up for the uh, uh, last weekend. And so we'd like to invite you to come out and uh, enjoy the air park. We've got trees, so you can bring a picnic lunch and have that out underneath the trees. Again, we'll be open from 9 until 2 on Saturday. We do request uh, that you uh, pre-purchase your tickets if you can. Uh, that's just going to make it easier for, uh, for a touchless, uh, touchless environment here. So we've got Don, Don Nix on here again. Hi, Don. Glad to see you. Well, I know this is going to be a relatively short, short uh, visit here with the airplane today. Uh, I'm going to sit here underneath the wing of the O2 where it's kind of where I can see the screen. So if anybody has any questions, this would probably be a good time to, uh, to ask those. So what we've got left in our inventory We've got an OH-58, but that was damaged in a storm last summer, and we're not going to be able to show you that one. It's just not suitable for uh, for that. But we do have the Owen Bird Dog, and we have the OV-10 Mock-Up. And they're sitting side by side, which is interesting positioning since uh, the OV-10 Mock-Up uh, replaced uh, the or the OV-10 Mock-Up replaced the O-1. So I'm not seeing anything in the way of uh, of more questions. So I'm going to walk out here, let you see the airplane a little bit more, step back, give you a full view. So we'll be back with you on Saturday. We'll be open on Saturday, but we'll also do another, uh, another fun with aviation. And again, if you've got any particular subjects you'd like us to, uh, to do for you, uh, whether it be an airplane or anything else, Let's see, and I'm not all of a sudden I walk out up from under the wing so I can't see it. Uh, okay, I'm sorry I can't read that last uh, that last question. I think it's uh, I think it's Mike James. So at any rate, folks, we'd like to thank you. Keep safe uh, and uh, come back and see us on Saturday. Again, we've got lots and lots of videos now on our uh, on our YouTube uh, channel. We have over 100 videos there. Uh, we've combined uh, our uh, our channel with another channel uh, for the uh, from the Av uh, Av History Buff. So we've got over 100 videos on our YouTube channel. And if you go and visit that, we would really appreciate if you would press that uh, that red subscribe button. Uh, that way, you'll be notified anytime we put any new videos up. And we're probably going to be getting some more. We're talking to another group about putting all of their videos on with ours too, and uh, that will make for a huge library. Our, uh, our June newsletter just went out, so if you're not getting our newsletter and you would like to, you can go to fortworthaviationmuseum.com on the internet and, a, and you'll get a pop-up. Oh, we got something here making noise, let's see. We've seen a lot, we've been seeing a lot of the 130s here lately. So at any rate, I mentioned if uh, you would like to start getting our newsletter, uh, you can go to uh, fortworthaviationmuseum.com and uh, you can sign that up. And let's see, oh, Mike James says, I vote for the for the bird dog next. Okay, we'll plan on doing the bird dog on, on Saturday. Uh, the Owen bird dog, it fits into the history of all of these FAC airplanes in a very interesting manner. And especially when we talk about what was taking place between 1948 and 1954, when we were developing the T-28, the T-37, the T-33, and the O-1 Bird Dog fits right in there. So at any rate, uh, thanks for being with us today. Hope you have a good rest of the week. Stay safe, and we'll see you on Saturday.